So this is a rational number, and this is a rational function. A function divided by a function, a number divided by a number. Rational number, rational function. Now these rational functions can be really difficult to integrate unless you split them up into a few different fractions. Now in order to do that, we need to consider a couple of different cases. The first one is proper rational functions. That is where you've got a function divided by a function, but the one on the top has a smaller degree than the one on the bottom. So an example of a proper rational function, here it is here, uh, a linear function divided by a quadratic function. So degree one, degree two, that's proper. If I change it slightly and make it 2x squared plus 5 over x cubed plus 3x minus 4, this is still proper because this is degree 2 and this is degree 3. So look at the leading coefficient. Of course, you can probably guess there's improper ones as well. Um, let's look at them. These are improper. You can see this is improper because degree 3 on the top, degree 2 on the bottom. But this is also improper because they both have the same degree. So we're only interested for the moment in proper ones and proper rational functions have a lower degree on the top than on the So some rules to follow when doing this, right? If we have a number on the top or a linear function on the top and we have a quadratic on the bottom, we've got it in factorized form here, we can write it as a over 4x minus 9, the first linear factor, plus b over 2x plus 5, the second linear factor. Now I've just taken away the numbers there and generalized it. Now remember, g of x needs to either be just a number, the number 5, or some linear function, ax plus b. It needs to be smaller than the thing on the bottom, and the thing on the bottom here is a quadratic. And then we can break it up into the factors. All right, well, let's try something that uses that rule. We're going to learn another couple of rules as well, but let's do something that uses that. So first example here, we're going to take this and we're going to resolve it into partial fractions. We're going to cut it into two fractions here. Now you might be looking at it saying, wait, it doesn't, it doesn't look like that, but it's a quadratic, so we can easily split x squared plus 2x minus 3 into two factors. So now that we've uh, factorized and split it into two factors, we can write it just like this. Now that a over, we can use this factor here, x minus 1, plus the next one, b over x plus 3. All right. And you might be looking at this going, okay, well, this is fine. We're using the denominator bits, but we haven't considered the 3x plus 5 on the top. And that's what happens in this next step. Because now what we do is behave like we want to add these two fractions back together again. If we want to add these two fractions back together again, the easiest way to do it is to multiply the numerator by x plus 3, the numerator by x minus 1, and put them all over a single denominator, x minus 1 times x plus 3. Just try to keep in mind that I'm not doing anything crazy here. I'm just adding two fractions the same way that a year 7 would add two fractions, just by making the denominators the same and then adding them together. Now what I have is something that we can work with. If we know that all of this is equal to the thing that we started with, well, that denominator is the same as that denominator, so those denominators are equal, which means that the numerators must be equal. And so now we have this equation here. 3x plus 5 equals a bracket x minus 1 plus b bracket x plus 3. And you might be thinking, well, this looks like, this looks bad because we've got too many variables. So how are we going to resolve this issue of having too many variables? The key is understanding that this is a function. This started its life as a function. And a function, you can place any values in for x that you want. 1, 2, 3, 4, whatever, right? So if I substitute a clever number in for x, I'm going to be able to smash two variables out in a single go. If I substitute, say, negative 3 in for x, I'm going to get negative 3 plus 3 here, which is going to be b times 0. And b times 0 will be 0. So I'm going to be able to put a number in for x and then smash out the b if I choose the right number for x. I could also smash out the a by choosing the number 1 for x as well. But I'm going to choose the number th negative 3. Let's put it in and see what happens. All right, so I've substituted that in there now. 3 times negative 3 is negative 9, plus 5 is negative 4. a times negative 4 is negative 4a, plus, and then this b times 0 is 0. So we're left with this really neat negative 4 equals negative 4a, divide negative 4 by negative 4, 
and that means that a is going to be equal to 1. So now that I've pulled that trick once and figured out that a is equal to 1, I can just pull the trick a same time, but instead of substituting negative 3 in for x, I can substitute whatever I need to put into here. In this case, if I put 1 in, it'll be 1 minus 1 is 0, that'll get rid of our a, and we'll be able to solve for b. So taking the equation that we had right here, putting 1 in, that's going to give us 3 times 1 plus 5 is 8. That a times 0 is just going to be 0. And then b times 4, that's 4b. Which of course means that b is equal to 2. And we are finished now because we started with a function that looked like this, 3x plus 5 over x squared plus 2x minus 3. We factorized and we said, right, if it looks like that, then it can be these two fractions. And finally, we can say, therefore, a is 1, 1 over x minus 1, plus b is equal to 2, 2 over x plus 3. All right, so we have found a, a partial fraction, a sum of fractions that is equal to the rational function that we started with. Uh, now, we can do this with some other forms of rational function as well. So I took a little break there. New shirt, new day, uh, new formula. g of x equals cx plus d squared. So a linear function on the bottom squared. That's going to result in that same linear function, not squared, plus that same linear function squared. All right, so compare and contrast here. Now, we're going to do a worked example here. We're going to do a worked example where we kind of combine these two ideas together. So here's our question, and you can see it's got a few things going on here. Some function on the top, but just degree 1, and now we've got a function on the bottom that's degree 3, because it's a squared here and a thing here. If we expanded that, we'd have an x cubed there somewhere. All right, so looking at this first bracket, this x plus 1, that looks a lot like this top one here, this ax plus b. So that's going to result in this bit right here. So, so far so good. We've got a over that x plus 1. Now, this x minus 1 squared, that's going to follow this rule here, which means that we're going to have to have uh, just the linear term on the bottom, and then we're going to have to also have the linear term squared on the bottom. So, we're combining our two rules here. We have a linear thing on the bottom here, which gives us our a, and then I'm using b and c here because I've already used a. So instead of using a for the linear term on the bottom, I'm using b. Instead of using b for the um, squared term on the bottom, I'm using c. Now that we've got that, it's time to push all of these together again into a single fraction with a common denominator of x plus 1, x minus 1 squared. That's what it's going to look like. Now, it's a little bit hard to keep track of, right? So a over x plus 1. To make it have this denominator, we would need to multiply top and bottom by x minus 1 squared. To have b have this denominator, we would need to multiply it by x plus 1, and then one more lot of x minus 1 to have that. And c, we just need to multiply top and bottom by x plus 1 to give us that same denominator. Now, when it comes to partial fractions, this step, because the next step I'm going to do is say, well, if the right hand, left hand side is this over this, and the right hand side is this over this, then the numerators must be the same because the denominators are the same. We do this so often with partial fractions that we don't have to do that. We can just kind of skip the step where we show the denominator and jump straight to this. Numerator equals numerator. All right, so we can pull the same sorts of tricks. Um, if we let x equal 1, uh, 1 minus 1 will be 0, so that a will disappear. If we let it x equal 1, um, 1 minus 1 will be 0, so 0 times that times that. The b will also disappear, and we'll get left with just a c value. So let x equal 1, we get this, which is 12 equals 2c, which means that c equals 6. So now if I let x equal negative 1, uh, that should pull the same trick. x equals negative 1, the c is going to cancel out. x equals negative 1, that bracket's going to become 0, which means the whole thing becomes 0, and I'll be able to figure out what a is. So... Let's let x equal negative 1. So when we do that, what do we get? We get negative uh, 2 plus 10 is 8. And then we have negative 2 squared, which is 4. So we say that that's 4a, which means that a will be equal to 2. So I know what a is. I know what c is. I need to figure out what b is. Now, just switching colors so it's easier to see. This is the same equation that's written all the way back up here again. But we have new information. We know that a is equal to 2, and we know that c is equal to 6. 
that gets us a little bit closer because now we just have an X and a B that we don't know. Now, X can be literally anything. We can shove in anything, a million, two million, negative a thousand, whatever. Let's put zero in for X and then we'll be able to find out what B is. So that's what it looks like. Um, we've got 10 equals two minus B plus six. And we can solve that for B now and B is gonna be negative two. We are finished. We can write this now as this full partial fraction. Complete solution, 2x plus 10 over all of that is equal to all of this, A, B, and C values there. Uh, now, we have one more version of this that we need to look at. If some component of your rational function is made up of a function over an irreducible quadratic, something you can't factorize neatly like this, then you're going to get something like this, dx plus e over that irreducible quadratic. Now again, you can combine these rules together. And in this question, you can see we're gonna to have to combine these rules together. Because we've got this x minus two, this linear factor here in the, in the denominator. So we're gonna to have to use this rule here for that one, there, there. And then we've also got this irreducible quadratic. So we're gonna to have to use that rule there. So this can be expressed in the following way. A over this linear factor plus bx plus c over this quadratic. Now, you see b, c, d, e. Those letters don't matter. I'm just using alphabetical order along the top as I need them. All right, so same rules apply. Let's smush this fraction together. As we go, we're speeding up. There's no need to write the denominator here because we know they're just going to cancel out eventually. These are the two numerators of these fractions. I've taken a and multiplied by that. I've taken bx plus c and multiplied it by that. Now, what next? Well, we've got an A, B, and a C here, but I can get rid of the B and the C in a single trick by letting X equal two, because that'll be zero, and zero times that will be zero, and I'll be left with that neat little thing. But once you let X equal two, some pretty trivial stuff after we know that A is equal to three. Now, the B, X, and the, the B and the C, that's a little more tricky. Um, let's put three in to our equation, first of all. So what we have is a quadratic is equal to all of this nonsense. Now, if I expand absolutely all of my brackets, I'm going to be able to match up x squared terms with x terms and constant terms. So I'm going to expand all those brackets. And once they're all expanded, we can start to group our x squared terms, our x terms and our constant terms. So we know that x squared, 3x squared plus bx squared, so 3 plus b goes here. We know our x terms, 3x, negative 2bx, and cx. So we can say that that's going to be 3 minus 2b plus c, all multiplied by x. And then finally, our constant term. I'm just going to put a plus here just so I don't get confused. Constant term here of 3 and negative 2c, plus 3 minus 2c. Now, remember, all of this is equal to that. And once we've done that, we can say, right, well, x squared, that's 1 times x squared. That means that 1 is equal to 3 plus b. Of course, means that b is equal to negative 2. Now, look here. Our constant term is 5, which means that 5 must be equal to 3 minus 2c. And that's it. I have the three things I need. I know that a is equal to 3. I know that b is equal to negative 2. And I know that c is equal to negative one, and I can put that all together into this formula here. Now there's my solution, pretty straightforward, A, B, and C values here. Uh, it's a bit ugly though, because the B and the C values are both negative, so I can fix that up by making that positive a negative, and making both of those positive. That's equal, just a bit neater. Okay, partial fractions, these are the proper rational fractions where the numerator has a lower degree than the denominator. In a future video, we'll look at what happens when they're upside down. Uh, but for now, that's enough. Uh, remember, you've got your rules here. Make sure you remember that you can combine them if you need to combine them. And we are done.